As a young person living in Ireland, I was always brought up to believe that if you did something wrong, you apologise for it. If you did something wrong, you acknowledge it. In recent years, I've discovered that that is not often the case and many people in Ireland go unheard and unrecognised for the injustice they suffered. Maureen Sullivan and several other Magdalene survivors are these people. For years they have failed to have their stories heard and are often shunned by the very people who are to help them. Five years ago, I decided I would try and do something to help these women, their cause and their campaign. I began by helping one Magdalene survivor, Maureen Sullivan. But what was supposed to be an attempt to expose Ireland's hidden past became a passion and a crusade to highlight one of Ireland's greatest injustices. This is the story of the Forgotten Maggies. Meet Maureen Sullivan. At the age of 12, Maureen was taken from her school in County Carlow and placed at St Mary's Magdalene Laundry, New Ross, County Wexford. By day, she would work at this laundry, but by night, she would sleep at St Aidan's Industrial School. For six years, she was denied her right to education and in effect never had the opportunity to question that decision until she returned to Ireland 30 years later. And so for us, our story begins. For me, you always felt less than anybody else, no matter who was talking to you. Like, you think back, hold on a minute here, why didn't I get my education? Why was I sent to Neurods? Why was I put down there working in that laundry? Why was I cleaning a church floor all day of a Saturday? And I only a young girl where I should have been out playing, I should have been enjoying life, meeting other children, having conversations with other children. How come all this was taken from me? For what? What did I do? I kept looking back, what did I do that was so wrong that I didn't want to go to school in the presentation convent? I wanted to go out and live with my grandmother. You know, where was my crime? I was trying to look, what crime did I commit? That all this terrible, terrible thing that happened to me, why did they do this? Why wasn't there somebody there to stick up for me and say, look, at this, this girl is on, she's a child, she shouldn't be here, this is wrong. Then I come home for a holiday and I said to my mum, you know, why was I in New Ross? Why did I go there? Why was I working in the Magdalen Laundry? And, my mother sat down to explain to me, oh, she said it was a lovely place and that you get educated and I really believed her and, you know, we discussed. Then I went back to England, well, you know, this is not good enough. I'm not getting proper answers here. That still, how could this happen? And how are they allowed to get away with it? And, you know, it just all felt wrong and you can start going down in terrible depression. Then my marriage started to go wrong. And, uh, then I, that's when I tried to commit suicide. And, and then when you wake up in a hospital bed in the morning and they said you were near death, and that changes your life. That's a, that's a big wake-up call. On returning to Ireland, Maureen decided she would take her case to the redress board, and it was here she discovered that under the terms of the redress board scheme, one must prove that they were resident in an industrial school in order to claim for compensation. Maureen had no proof that she was sent to St Aidan's Industrial School and her case was thrown out on the basis that she was not a resident under the terms of the Redress Board Act 2002. Convinced that St Aidan's Industrial School and St Mary's Magdalene Laundry were connected, Maureen continued to fight this case. But, to me, the building is all the one. As a child, and you're taken from the Magdalene Laundry and you're coming over across on a corridor and up the stairs and into bed. To me, it's all the one. The one building? Is it's it? all the one building. And because you're coming along a corridor. You don't go out and go in and out on the road and down and into another building. Then I would class it as different buildings. So how he m said that I wasn't consistent was it was only when I went down there and I was in the Magdalen side, and it's a school now. And I said, but God, I said, I didn't sleep here. And there was a man down there, I don't, I don't know if he was a caretaker or not, and there was a, a lady, clean, a cleaning lady. 
And I said, oh, I can't ask if there was a tunnel here, they're going to say I'm cracked. And the tunnel kept coming into my head and coming, and I knew where I was standing. I said, I used to leave here through a doorway and go down into the tunnel. So I said, no, I'm going to ask. And I said, there's a tunnel along here. Oh, yes. He says, over there. He said, that's all barred up now. And I says, all right. And I said, that leads into the convent. And he says, oh, yeah. He said, that would be right. And I said, the convent leads to St. Aidan's. Or up onto another building. I didn't know it was St. Aidan's at the time. Up onto, I said, that's where I slept. That's where it is. So I came back to Carlo, and the young lady, Mary, uh, I think was her name, said to me, um, she kept looking at me, and she said, do you ever remember a girl that used to put under the tunnel here and hide them when the men with the suits came? No, I think I said when the men with the suits came. And she said, yes, she said, they were the inspectors. I said, is that who they were? I said, that was me. So tell us about the first day you met Maureen in New Ross. Uh, we were working in school and she just came in and she was talking about the Magdalene laundry and I just happened to say to her, when she said she was there herself, I said to her, do you ever remember the girl that they had used to hide when there was an inspector coming? And she just started crying. She said, that was me. So on the way up, you see, there was a, you had to go in this big gate and there was a laundry door on the left hand side that used to be left open because there was the furnace or something there that kept the laundry going and there was this girl who used to run it and she used to come out and talk to us going up and she told us about I think her name was Ala Francis or yeah. something like that. It was a funny name. And what did she tell you? She told us about when the inspector would be coming, the way the girl that worked in the laundry was always being hid. And, I, and did you ever did you ever like pay any attention to that thing? Yeah, sure. I used to say to her, um, "Why would he hide her like?" Yeah. You know. And I said, I said to her one day, "I bet she's from a big person's house, yeah. and they don't want anyone to know that she's in there." And that's amazing, because according to the School Attendance Act, nineteen twenty six, section seven, paragraph two. Any person who employs a child in contravention of a regulation shall be guilty of an offence. Section 6, paragraph 2, also states that if and whenever the ordinary residence of a child to whom this act applies, i.e. Maureen, is changed from one school attendance area to another school attendance area, you must inform the minister within one week of this change. And as this never happened in Maureen's case, the Good Shepherd Convent could do whatever they liked with Maureen once they didn't get caught. She said they are denying that that happened. She said, you are the first person that ever uh, knew about me, like, you know, so. Is it, is it up straight up here, is it? Yeah, up here so what's is up where here? I slept. This is the place where I've slept. Now. What's that? Is that the Magdalene Laundry? Saint Aiden. No, that's St. Aidan's. Right. Down along here is the corridor where you go down along, down into the convent, and down into the Magdalen Laundry. There is a connection there, even though they're saying there's no connection. There's it's all of the one. All right. The nuns wasn't in any different cloaks or different uniforms up here. Oh, you're they saying... were the same nuns, Good Shepherd nuns. After meeting Maureen that day in New Ross, I took it upon myself to write a four page letter on her behalf to six different government departments within Ireland asking why it was someone like Maureen was not entitled to claim for compensation under the current redress board scheme. This was their response. Dear Ms O'Sullivan, I am directed by the Tarnished and Minister for Justice, Equality and Law Reform, Mr Michael McDowell, TD to acknowledge receipt of your recent letter. As this matter is more appropriate to the Department of Education and Science, your correspondence has been referred to the Department for their attention and direct reply to you. Uh, dear Ms Sullivan, Mr Seamus Brennan, TD, Minister for Social Affairs, has asked me to acknowledge receipt of your recent letter regarding the Readdress Board scheme. As this matter is pro P 
P-R-O-P or proper is proper to the Department of yeah. Justice, Equality and Law Reform. The Minister has passed your letter to Mr. Michael McDowell, TD. Um, what do you think? <laughs> I just, I had to laugh when I read that one. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's what you said. One is contradicting the other. Yeah. I think really what they're looking for, Stephen, is we're looking, we'll just send her back an answer. This, she might get fed up. She'll go away. I think that's what they're, they expect. But I think as long as people don't go away, that, that's when they learn. That's the only time they learn the lesson is when people don't go away. Over the next few weeks, I convinced Maureen to reopen her claims to redress board and submit the four-page letter in the hope she would finally have the chance to get justice. Within six months, I'd made contact with several other Magdalene survivors, and as Maureen's case was now up and running, I decided to travel across Ireland and the UK, where I'd meet Josephine Mead, Maureen Taylor, Mary King, Mary Collins, Kathleen Legg, Marina Gambold, Mary Smith and Mary Condon. Each of these women would offer me a further insight into the workings of the Magdalene Laundry system throughout Ireland. It is with their stories and that of Maureen Sullivan that the passion and crusade to highlight one of Ireland's greatest injustices will continue for the next two years. We were entrusted into their care, right? And they were supposed to look after us. They were supposed to take the place of our parents and our families, right? But we were put down from day one by them nuns. And we were crucified by them. And we were nothing. And we were punished for nothing. Whether you'd done something or you didn't do it, you were blamed, you know. And there was always a gang of us there that were blamed. There were six girls that were always blamed for everything that went wrong. And they get your brush, a handbrush, and the beach, yeah, and beach with the handbrushes, the beach with clothes hangers, the beach with hair brushes. She didn't care what the beach with. There was one nun there, and she was the biggest bitch walking. She was vicious, an absolute lunatic. They tried to get me certified when I was 11 years of age. They introduced themselves to me when I went out. They woke me up at 12 o'clock that night because they say your morale is the lowest between 12 and 3. Right? So they woke me up and they brought me out to the washroom. And the washroom uh, had about five, five, six basins in it. And the two of them were sitting down inside and they said, Hello, how are you, Josephine? And I said, I'm, I'm all right. And they started talking to me and they said, We heard that you uh, hit a girl today. And I said, Yeah, I did. And they said, Why did you do it? I said, Because such was mocking me and my family. And I said, I don't like it. I said, We get enough of that aside from the nuns, besides the girls at it. So he said, tell me about it, he said, and tell me what's been said to you and done. I told him everything. I told the two doctors everything that was said to me and done to me since I went there. And the beatings and everything else. And um, they turned around, they called the nun in, and they said, look, sister, you can go in and take this girl back and put her into a bed. There's no way we're signing that girl away. That girl is not... Mad. That girl is too intelligent for you. But the nuns tried to say that you were mental. Yeah, they, they'd done this. They got rid of kids overnight and nobody ever knew. And if you ask them, where, where is such and such one gone? You know? None of your business and you get a slap across the face. It's a mental institution to be gone for life. According to the archive material based at St Mary's Magdalene Laundry in Donnybrook, County Dublin, Many of these women were transferred to Grange Gorman, St. Brendan's or St. Lohan's state-run mental institutions. The archives also show us that many of the women were presented by a social worker, solicitor, the guardee or a family member. Some women were even transferred to and from Mountjoy Prison or to other known Magdalene laundries operating in Ireland through Cork, Limerick, Galway, Waterford or Wexford. Okay, so tell us about how you actually ended up in a Magdalene Laundry. Um, when I left uh, the Justice School in Mallow, my mother decided that she wanted to take me to England. And uh, I went over and um, 
I didn't get on with my stepfather. And my mother decided to get in touch with Sister in Mallow. And Sister said that she would bring me back and put me into a training centre. Now, I didn't realise, Stephen, that I was going to be put into a Madeleine Laundries. I had never heard of them. And I was put on a plane back to Dublin Airport and I was met by the guards. And I was put into a guard car at late at night and I was driven to the Madeleine Laundries out in High Park. And when you arrived at High Park, what happened next? Um, I was, I was uh, met at the door by a nun and um, she brought me into this room and she sat me down and spoke to me and she took my name from me. First of all, she said, we don't know your name here now. Your name is going to be Monica. And we have to remove all your clothes and you have to wear certain type of clothes here. And that was all sorted out and that's what happened. And I was brought to a dormitory. It was about 12 o'clock at night. I was brought to a dormitory, which was very big. There must have been about 70 people sleeping in the dormitory. And I was shown my bed and I had to uh, say some prayers. I was told to kneel down and say some prayers before I went to bed. Now, I was 16 years of age. And the next morning I was awoken at about half six, seven, and to the sound of everybody praying. Describe the system, describe the regime. Like, how, d obviously the nuns would have worked with you, helping you do the laundry. I can't remember that. So the nuns would never have done anything? I can't remember that. They were saying the, uh, the rosary around you, what you had to uh, kind of pray or, or, or whatever. And no, no. You know, you see, we must tell the truth here. We were child slaves. I never got educated from them at all. I never was educated. And that is the God's truth. They would, they would say that your education would have been working in the laundry. How could you be? Where would that get you? That, that's not education to me. That's slavery. That's child slavery. And do you know what? No doubt about it. No, I, I, I do respect the question you ask him. No doubt about it. The court put me in there not to work in the laundry. I got a sentence from the court to go in there. Because those days they never changed the paper around for to um, the, the, the paper that was signed for me as abandoned child on the street was for children that committed a crime. And I commit no crime to anybody. And I was put in that convent. And that's a God's truth. I was put in that convent. And I was a slave. I was. I was never, ever educated. I've got a great memory. I was never educated in there. But, like, you would have obviously celebrated, like, you know, birthday parties and... What? Like... You must be joking. I never... S Even, I never had a birthday party in my life or I never had a birthday card. It's only for the last few years I've had a birthday card. No, we didn't. And how do they, tr how do they treat the other women, so? Well, some of them were treated, I think they were even treated worse because uh, they had no one belonged to and they were fallen women. The only time I fell was when I was bloody hungry and fell down with the hunger. My brother didn't know me when he came to the door. He said, I'm looking for my sister, Marina Bourne. There's no Marina Bourne here, she said. You must be looking for Fidelma. And he nearly died when I saw me, I was skin and bone. Skin and bone, like... How many years were you in the Magdalene Laundry? I was just over the two years. And for the two years, was it constant abuse? Yes, uh, but the fear, the fear was put into you. And even when I came out, I was frightened, frightened to death. Do you feel that you've missed out in life? I do, yes. How? I think I would have, uh, if I'd had the chances, the right chances, I could have done a lot better in life. Don't get me wrong, I have done, I've got three beautiful sons, which I adore, and I have done well in life, considering the start I had, you know? Sorry. 
so I think they helped me a lot. They are my, they are my life. I know. Do you think that the nuns held you back? Oh, definitely. As I say, they made you feel worthless. Sorry. They made you feel that they were better than you were. No matter what. And nobody questioned it. As you know, as you said, did anybody come in? There was nobody to come in to see what was going on. We were classed as nothing. We were told that we came from nothing. We never would be anything. And we would always go back to being nothing. Many of the women who left the Magdalene Laundries in Ireland escaped to England, America, Australia and beyond. Some of these women were never to return home again and Kathleen Legg is one such person. Born in County Tipperary, Kathleen now lives in Bournemouth, England and for almost 50 years has kept her silence about her time spent in a Dublin Magdalene Laundry. This is the first time Kathleen has ever spoken openly about her time in the institution. She too was promised a better education. But unknown to her, her mother and her entire family, Kathleen would spend over two years slaving for the nuns in what seemed to be an ordinary school from the outside. Um, even, I was married for 38 years and my husband never knew that I'd been in a, in a home like this. I never told him. He often wondered why I was having such bad nightmares. And even my children now, nobody knows. I've never been able to tell anybody. When... You look back at it now, what, what kind of feeling does it bring up in you? Um, anger, a lot of anger, particularly against, uh, particularly against the two nuns. Why particularly them? Because of the way they treated me. I, I seem to be single, perhaps um, I've, in my mind I feel as if I was singled out, possibly because of my height. I felt perhaps I, I was intimidating if my height was against them. And I have, um, I've used to have a lot of nightmares, very, very bad nightmares when I, when I left. And it was always somebody, um, I don't know whether you want to know about it or not. Yeah, of course I do. It was always somebody, um, I would wake up and I, I, I stayed with a friend. I broke my, um, I fractured my kneecap, so I stayed with her. She put me in a room which had an non -suede. And I must have had a horrific night, nightmare. I woke up, when the nightmare started, I would wake up screaming. It happened a couple of times when I was married. There's always somebody in black standing by my bed. And perhaps this goes back to the time when the man from the mental hospital uh, came into the, um, the room that I was sleeping in. It was all, all, it's the nightmare was always somebody in black standing by my bed. You were sent into like, a training education centre for girls, wasn't that it? Yes. But now, this, this leads you to believe that it is a proper training con uh, college or convent. But in actual work, it was, it was real work. It's, there were 13 Magdalene Laundries operating throughout Ireland from 1798 until September 1996. According to the archive material based at St Mary's Magdalene Laundry in Donnybrook, County Dublin, the Eastern Health Board were funding these institutions from 1979 until 1994. In 1979, the Magdalene Laundries were receiving £3 per week per person. However, this overall total had risen to £18 per week per person by 1994. During the research of this documentary, I was also presented with a writing-in book from a Magdalene Laundry based in County Dublin. The book indicates to us that the Magdalene Laundries were generating funds from outside individuals, companies, state bodies or government departments, which generated funds on average of £900 
per week. But remember, none of the women ever received a wage for the work that they did at these institutions. You said, yes, it was slavery, because you worked all those years and all those hours, and you never, uh, I never had a penny in my pocket. Um, when we were there, I didn't know of any other um, laundries existed with children working in it. It was only in later years that I found out about it. So you always assumed that this was just it's one place in Ireland that place. did this? That's right. We assumed it was the one place and that was it. Did, did you feel that you've missed out in life? Yes. Yes, I have. And no education to begin with. When you I say think. no education, explain. Well, in my, um, my early life as well, um, as I told you about my, my childhood, um, I didn't get a, good, a very good education. So um, it continued on. Well, there was no, um, no education at all in St Mary's. There was no opportunity, to, well, no opportunity to read, which I would have liked to have had some books. There were no games, no puzzles, which would have helped you, which would have passed the time. But why, why didn't you have anything? Why weren't you given the opportunity? Like, who prevented that? There was nobody to talk to. The only people you could know. All the time I was there, I never saw the Reverend Mother. Nobody said. The, uh, sometimes the nuns who called your number, or sometimes in the laundry, were young nuns, and they would just come and probably just look into the laundry and that was it. Or come and call your number at night, or wake you up in the morning, or call your number when you went to, went to bed. Do you have any happy memories of being there? No. No. Not one? No, not one. Honestly? Yes. Not one. <laughs> no, that's fine. I always felt, um, I was always very unhappy there. And I think on a couple of occasions, um, on one particular night, I, I fell out of bed and I brought the mattress with me on top of me. But the other girls come and helped me put the back. But there was nobody to call on. If, if there'd been any um, a fire or anything at night, uh, there would have been a, a lot of trouble probably. Why? I don't think we would have survived. The only communication at night time was a doorway at the end of a large dormitory with a bell which we never rung because there was never any occasion to, uh, to ring it. But if there had been a fire or anything there, there would, there would have been no way we would have been able to get out. When I like to be down to go to sleep at night, it's every night. I can still see the convent. I can see every picture, every um, room in the building. Is it in haunts, yeah? Oh, yes. My life changed when I came over here. Completely, completely changed. But of course the memory is still there, you can't block out. There's that part of your life that you'll never block out. Even to the day I die, it'll be with me. It's sad to think that none of these women have any happy memories of their time spent in Ireland's Magdalen Laundry. I travelled from Bournemouth to London and the next day I met a woman by the name of Mary Collins. Mary's mother, Angela Collins, lived and died in a Magdalen Laundry based at St Peacock's Lane in Cork City for over 27 years. As a result, Mary and her other siblings ended up in industrial schools, orphanages and adopted to other families in the south of Ireland. Mary's story further shows us how the Catholic Church and Irish state failed these Magdalene women and their children. I've known the Magdalene women since I was about seven years of age, where I used to have to visit the home to see my mother. So um, I find it very, very hard to talk about it. I've blocked a lot of it out. I try not to think about it. I've got my own way of coping about it. I have the redress statement, and I find this is the only way I can speak today. And I feel to, for me to go back and try and remember it, I think I'll become very, very angry and depressed. So I think it's easier if I read part of my statement now, which acknowledges my mother and acknowledges the whole situation. Otherwise, I don't think I could do this today to kind of let you know how the Madly women, how I see the Madly women yeah. and how they were treated. My name is Mary Collins. I was born on the 13th of July, 1960, in Carasavine, in County Kerry. My mother was Angela Collins. She had three children and I was the middle of one. My eldest sister went to the Good Shepherds in Cork and sadly, she took her own life when she was 27. My younger sister was 16 months younger than me and she was adopted but we are in touch now, sadly for her. Her adopted parents died when she was young. I felt alone that I had this secret and I had a mother. The thought of going to see my mother 
actually scared me. I left her home for the first time with this matron. Her name was... She scared me and she was physically and mentally abusing me. I never talked to her because I wasn't allowed to speak to her. Once out of the home and on the train, kicked me. I was miserable while on the train. The train stopped in Cork and we walked down the town and got the number two bus to St Mary's Road. Walked in front of me. I followed her. I was going up to a big building with holy statues outside. I ran the door. A nun answered. I was sent into this room with a big round table and four chairs in a big clock on the wall. It was very cold. It took ages for my mother to come. I sat in silence waiting for her. I could hear her heavy walking in the hallway as she came down it. The door opened and it was sister and my mother and a friend of my mother's, Mary Ellen. My mother kept her eyes on the floor and said hello in a husky voice. She sat down and did Mary Ellen and nobody talked. My mother was staring at the table. She couldn't look at me. I didn't like the look of her eyes. They were sunk in and her movements were slow. The matron was kicking me under the table. She gave me an awful look. She was saying, talk to your mother. I couldn't. I didn't know how I was to talk to her as I was never allowed to talk to adults in the children's home. I sat there for a long time not understanding what I was to do and how I was to react. It was time to leave. I was happy. It was all over. The matron never spoke to me all the way back. She had no expression on her face. When the matron got me back into the home, she marched me in, hitting my head, throwing me to the ground. She brought me into the dressing area, stripped me naked. I was struggling, which she was hitting me, so she grabbed me and laid me down naked and I was screaming because she was hurting and stretching my hands behind my back. She called the big girls in to hold me down. They got pillows put over my head so she couldn't hear my screaming. I was saying, I'm so sorry, I won't do it anymore. I never knew what I did. She kept telling me I was like my mother. I remember giving up, lying there and not being able to breathe. When she had finished the beach, she threw me off the table. My body hurt. I wanted to sleep. I couldn't walk. She got the big girls to lift me outside to the coal house. That is where the black cat stayed. I felt cold there and all alone. She closed the door and locked it. I fell asleep. She came back when it was dark and made me go to bed. All the other children was asleep. My little body hurt. My time in the hole was full of fear. A lot of the children got beatings for being there. I was getting beaten because of my mother. I would be asleep and taken from my bed for snoring and stripped naked. This stretched me across the table in the washroom. Pillows put over my head and the big girls had me down as beat me. She used to hit me hard at my front and bottom. This was never done unless I was naked. Always used to pour pots of urine over my head that we used to go to the toilet at night. I was asleep when this happened. This is because of my snoring and when I woke up she reminded me I was dirty and I would turn out like my mother. I could only think she didn't like the look of my mother when she met her because she really seemed to hate me after that meeting. On my first Holy Communion, I made it with three other girls. I remember the matron pushing me down the stairs before I went to church in my communion dress. I never remember one day I wasn't beaten. I was always doing something to me. She would cut my nails and toenails very far back and they would bleed. This was very sore. My front tooth was broken. But I had my face hit off sinks when washing my hair. I had my face pushed to the desk with force. I used to have nosebleeds because of this. This happened every day at school. I never knew my mother in any way other than someone I got abused over. But I was very frightened. I had to wear the same pants for a whole week and if it was dirty she would make me wear it over my head. I changed my pants the same night as, night as I had a bath. I lost my name in the home. I was number five. I knew my name was Mary because they used it in the school. It used to make me get into a very hot bath. My feet... My feet... Mary went on to outline over 50 minutes of abuse, which was physical and mental. For the first time in my life, I was ashamed to call myself Irish and I began to realise the enormity of what these women suffered. 
This is not a story just about Mary or Maureen. This involves over 30,000 women that were separated, secluded from Irish society. What does that say about the people who put these women in these institutions? What's that say about the people who ran our country? When I came back to Ireland, I decided it was time to make a stand. And I began to write letters on the women's behalf to the Irish Commissioner on Human Rights and the European Court on Convention for Human Rights. But ultimately, the women's story was falling on deaf ears. It was at this point I met a woman by the name of Mary Smith. She had a similar story to that of Mary Collins. But ultimately, Mary's story would take an unfortunate twist as she would end up in both an industrial school and Magdalen Laundry in Cork. And when I went in there, they were changing my name to Benedict, Anastasia. I said, you're not changing my name. And everything I possessed, including the wee photograph I had of the boy that I first felt love for, care, that was taken from me, which me meant the world, anything in the world. And what frightened me most of all was that when I saw all these elderly folk there, elderly ladies, that I was going to end up like that and the door was locked. And I would not eat for them. I wouldn't sleep for them. I just said to the Lord, let me die. Let me die. I'm not staying here. I wouldn't want to stay there. Why wouldn't you want to stay in the Magdalene Laundry? I knew I was never going to get out of there. I knew I was there for life. And I saw all the old ladies there. And then they gave me a long grey coat put on me. I mean, I was chopped up. Eventually this one come along, this one come along, and she says, we're having terrible trouble with this girl. And the other one says, yeah, she won't take a name. I wouldn't leave for them. And eventually they gave me that nun's name. And that's the name I got. So, uh, for three weeks, I would not stop crying. I wouldn't eat, they force fed me. I just, my body went into shock. Complete shock. So, I was told I was not to talk, ever, ever talk. And if I talked, I'd be leathered. Now, this brought me back to the industrial schools. You know, because I was leathered so much at the industrial schools. This was a continuation. But these were all grown up women. And the mere fact, I can remember distinctly, said to me, my mother was in some lockup. So I actually thought, one of them women could be my mother. And I used to be wondering, it was not my mother. I never knew my mother, you see. And I always thought this could be my mother. I look at an old woman in there and I say, that's my mother. And I could be what I was watching beside the laundry room. And anyway, every day, you got up at six o'clock, the bell rang, you didn't know the time because there was no such thing as time. Time meant nothing. All you did every morning, you went over to the mass, and after mass, there was about at least 200 women or more there. And they were in the refectory, and you were not allowed to talk all day. And somebody would read the Bible to you, okay? And everybody had a different name. Nobody had the same name, if you could understand what I'm talking about. And you wore these long white coats, grey coats, sorry. And the reason why I was afraid that I would be called to read the Bible, because for the simple reason I didn't know how to read or write because I never went to school in the industrial schools, only I was a scrubber. So, you were put straight then to the laundry, you walked in the laundry all day, there was about well, five or six nuns lined up and down, and you were not to talk all day. At two o'clock came, back to the refectory, none walk up and down, the same carry on, nobody was allowed to talk. 
and the same back to the lounge you went again. And then after that you had your breakfast, uh, sorry, your tea, I apologize, you have your tea. The Angelus, that's the only time I knew the time was the Angelus, the rose, and it was up to bed. There was a dim light on all day, all night, sorry. There was a dim light on all night, and I was left on, and the nun would walk around during the night to find out what was of us actually get down to bed to talk to each other. And I remember distinctly a woman dying there, and I was there, I think she was around 90. And all I heard one day, you're not to talk to somebody after dying. Nobody knew where that woman went, nobody knew what happened to that woman. And this, every day, this continued the same. Get up at six, the only time you were allowed to talk in there is when you prayed. He had prayers in the morning, prayers in the evening, benediction in the evening, the rosary. And I sat outside that door once when I was in there. And this maid thing, whatever you call that, rubbish, you walk around the grounds with a pole in front of you. And we had to say all hymns and all that codology and rubbish, brainwashing us. And then I was put back in there again. And what devastated my life, and I'm walking around like a shell since the day I was put out into the Magdalene Lounge. I said I shattered my life completely. And, and I will blame the church and state for doing this, incarcerating me into the Magdalene Lounge in case I had a child, in case I got pregnant. What is wrong with getting pregnant? What is wrong with having a child? Nothing. That is not a crime. And the majority of the women that were in there, the majority of them had children, were taken from them. My own mother, I believe, was put in, and she was four months pregnant. I mean, and she was put into the Magdalene Lounges as well, because she was a married mother. Who has the right? to take someone's life away. Who gives these people, the church and state, the power to take people's lives? They took my mother's life. They took my family away from me. They took my home away from me. They took my children I should have had because I had this fear. I could swear on it of having children. Because I was literally told the reason I ended up in the Magdalene lounges because my mother was an unmarried mother. I was completely shell-shocked as a young person living in Ireland to think that this was happening right in the 21st century. These women had suffered both emotionally, physically and socially. To think that someone like Kathleen Legg could not return to her hometown of Lives for Nan for almost 50 years to me is uncomprehendable. And I was delighted when she took up my offer to come back to see her home, her family, her neighbours and the school she left behind. I was probably about four years old then. How does it feel now coming back to your um, hometown? It's very emotional. Very, I'm, I'm very emotional to come in here and to walk around and in the home as well, bringing all the memories back. Uh, when I was 11 years old, probably just as I went in here, my grandmother died. And uh, my grandmother was the one that looked after me because my mother was in Dublin. And from 11 years old, I looked after myself from 11 to 14 years old. When did you go to Dublin then? Uh, when I was 14 years old, uh, my grandfather wrote and told my mother that she would have to come down and take me because he wanted to bring his son, Jimmy, into the house. Uh, Jimmy and his wife and his family wanted us to look after him. So she came down from Dublin and she took, back, took me back to Dublin and that was when she put me in St Mary's Training School. And did she think that it was a training school? Oh yes, yes, yes she did. And what happened? But she didn't realise that it was uh, the laundry at the back. As I travelled across Ireland and the UK, I was constantly helping Maureen to prove her case that the Magdalene Laundry and industrial school systems were connected. 
The interviewing of the women enabled me to understand that the system was entirely connected throughout. Six weeks later, I met up with Maureen in Limerick as she wanted to meet the Good Shepherds from her time spent at New Ross. After much consideration, the nuns finally allowed us to see Maureen's file. And then it hit me. There it was, faded and worn, in the midst of all the letters, all the files, was a piece of information that would change Maureen's story forever. It said, Maureen Sullivan confirmed that the parish church New Ross, County Wexford, on the 21st of March, 1965. The only question that remained in my mind was who got confirmed with Maureen on that exact date. The religious order established to me that it was the girls at St. Aidan's Industrial School who got confirmed with Maureen on that exact date. I quickly submitted this new information to the redress board as I knew it was in Maureen's favour to do so. It would take a further two and a half months before Maureen would finally have the chance to get justice. During this period, I asked Maureen to take me back down to New Ross because I wanted to see inside the tunnel. I wanted to see what Maureen saw when she was 12. Maureen, you're having a laugh. Yeah. I huh? wish. Are you, like, honest to God, you're brought down here. But well, it's here, you're here, and you can see it, yeah. See, I didn't make it up. I mean, the place is here. That is scary. But this does not exist. This tunnel does not exist. I'm making it up. Before I finish, there is one story of the Magdalene Laundries I feel remains untold. In 1993, the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity sold a plot of land to a developer at High Park, a farmer, Magdalene Laundry in Dublin. It was on this site the remains of several Magdalene women lay buried. To this day, many questions remain unanswered, and it is with this story I finish mine. Do you think it was a bit strange, we'll say, that the head nun didn't know how many bodies were in the graveyard? I did. I was very surprised. Because uh, we, we, and initially, I only gave a price. Like, I had to give a price for the job. For so much for each grave, like. But we, the first price we gave was only for 133. It turns out that the Department of Environment had granted permission to the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity to exhume and cremate the 133 women that lay buried on this site. However, according to the Environmental Health Officer report and that of Barney Kern, several inaccuracies remained with this exhumation. When the two or three days went by, I discovered then that there was more bodies than, than actually was, uh, they said there was. And when I confronted them then, they, they didn't know about them. A lot of the women had um, bandages, was it? That's right, no, a plaster of Paris. A lot of the, a lot of the women, either on their ankles, their elbows, their wrists, their hands. Still plaster of Paris when we took them out of the ground. Plaster of Paris was still on, on, on the corpse. And what's plaster of Paris, sorry now? Plaster of Paris were, 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 would be uh, breaks. And were actually on them when they died. Were you quite surprised that the women were buried in a mass plot? Well, it, it, it wasn't a mass. It was a, a kind of a garden. It was a little garden like type and it had an orchard of one end of it and it was away from the convent altogether. It was next to the wall, uh, and there was a big hotel at the back of it and it was just a little, uh, a little paddock like and that's where they were buried. Barney Kern informed the religious order that an extra 22 human remains laid buried on this site. This brought the overall total to 155 human remains. Only 103 of those match the exhumation licence granted by the Department of Environment. Many of these women had no first names, second names, date or cause of death. Some of these women had no death certificates and one woman was exhumed without her skull. Barney Kern also informed me that these same women had broken bones on their wrists, shoulders, ankles, fingers and even elbows. 
injuries they sustained while operating the huge machines at this Magdalen laundry. And yet nobody's willing to ask the question, what happened to these women? They were forgotten about. Just forgotten about. Just buried in a hole and that's it. Finished. After five and a half years, I discovered a part of my Irish history that I never knew existed. I gave several Magdalene survivors the opportunity for their stories to be heard, wrote numerous letters, made endless phone calls and organised several marches on their behalf. Yet none of these women have ever received an apology from the state of the church for the injustice they suffered. Some of these women have since died and others have become so institutionalised they would never cope in the outside world. Only a few find a voice to say enough is enough and at that it takes a lot to stand up and say I am a person, I matter, I existed, I am somebody, but least of all, I survived. From a distance the world looks blue and green And the snow-capped mountains white From a distance the ocean needs to stream Enough.